All right. So first of all, thank you so much for being here uh, during our Meet the Author event. We are with Save Barney Get Bay. And my name is Grace Ann Taylor. I'm the Education and Outreach Coordinator at Save Barney Get Bay. And we have the absolute honor to welcome Dan Fagan today, who's a professor at NYU for science journalism and who has made writing about the environmental science um, field a major part of his career. Um, today, we have the pleasure of discussing his best-selling novel, Tom's River, A Story of Science and Salvation, which has won many awards, including the 2014 Pulitzer for General Nonfiction, the New York Public Library's Helen Bernstein Book Award for Excellence in Journalism, the National Academy Science Book Award, and the Society of Environmental Journalists, Rachel Carson's Environmental Book Award, and even more than that. And of course, Dan himself has won two of the best known science journalism prizes in the United States, including the Science Journalism Award for the American Association of the, for the Advancement of Science, and the Science and Society Award of the National Association of Science Writers. Needless to say, <laughs> we're thrilled to have Dan with us. The story that Dan tells in this book is a culmination of science, politics, and the characters that lead us through the story of how corporate entities were able to dump toxic waste polluting our groundwater and our surface water. And so in addition to all of that, I do need to um, you know, just point out that September happens to be uh, Childhood Cancer Awareness Month, which I just learned today and is extremely relevant to our story today. Um, and give a shout out to Oceans of Love, which was founded right here in Tom's River. Uh, one of the co-founders is Linda Gillick, who if you read the book, you understand that she is a major major reason that this story even exists because she was so, um, you know, uh, pursuant, making sure that people learned and figured out what was going on um, with the pollution in Tom's River. So uh, just a few housekeeping things. Please make sure to mute yourself if you're not speaking so that um, we don't have anything interrupting uh, Dan. And then also, if you'd like to put questions in the chat, uh, Dan's going to do a few slides, and that's a perfect time for you to drop the chat questions in there. And uh, Britta Wenzel and I will be um, monitoring. Britta is the executive director at Save Barnegat Bay, and she would like to speak at the end. So please stay tuned all the way to the end to talk a little bit about something we're doing locally about the Tom's River. Completely different pollutant, but uh, I just want to give that little teaser. So stick around to the end. So without further ado, please take it away, Dan. Thank you for being here today. Okay, wow. Well, that was a uh, very uh, piece of introduction. Grace, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I always, the pressure is really on after an introduction like that. Uh, I should say that I am just really not a fan of, of uh, doing remote talks. I love talking to people in person and having that back and forth. So I'm going to do the best I can. Uh, I, uh, I generally say no, but I, I said yes when Grace Ann asked. And, and uh, there were three reasons, I think. One is that, well, I was going a little COVID crazy, I'll be honest with you. Uh, uh, quarantine, you know, it's really nice to get out. And so this is a way to get out. And the second reason is that, say, Barnegat Bay is such a good group and has been for so long. And is just really solid, sensible, important environmental work uh, in Ocean County and nearby. So that was a good reason. And then the third reason is, you know, I feel like this year the lessons of this book are just so relevant. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about that, you know, in the context of, of COVID and science denial and climate denial. You know, we can talk about all those things if you want. Uh, as Grace had mentioned, I thought I would give some slides and, and I don't know, I, I'm going to really just rush through them because I want to make sure that we have lots of time for Q&A. But it's a big book and it's, it's not really reasonable to assume that everyone has read this book. Uh, uh, and I do think it's important to sort of put it and give a little historical context and maybe quickly summarize the story for those of you who haven't seen it. So with that, I will activate share screen here. Let's see if I can do it successfully. 
Okay, is everybody seeing that all right? Yes. Great. Uh, so you all know where Tom's River more than just about any audiences that I speak to about this book. You completely understand where Tom's River is and, and sort of what the physical setting is. You know, the cultural setting, when I wrote this book, uh, Tom's River had a very sort of specific view of itself. You know, it's the kind of place where Little League was and is big, parades are big. The perfect day in Tom's River culturally would be a parade for the Little League. Uh, and it's a place that has, has a very specific view of itself. You know, many of you are from Tom's River, you know that the main drag is Washington Avenue, named for George Washington, but I always found it interesting that that was insufficiently patriotic for the people of Tom's River. So they, they called, they changed Washington Avenue to the Avenue of Americanism. They just really have a very clear view of, 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 of what Tom's River is all about. And yet, Tom's River is also the place where this happened. This is one of the giant uh, landfill cells where a huge amount of illegal, uh, of toxic waste was dumped illegally. And here it's being cleared out by guys in moon suits. Uh, this was in the 90s and early aughts. Uh, how many barrels were they removing that were buried there illegally and were leaking? Many thousands. You can get a sense of that from the numbers on this barrel. And Tom's River, this all-American city, is also the place where some of you will remember these things happened. You know, this was in the news. It was a, a very scary time there. Uh, yeah, yes. You know, there were different periods where things were hot in Tom's River, but 90, 1996 was maybe the hottest. And, and it was a very difficult time to be a resident of Tom's River. Um, my book is an effort to sort of make sense of what happened in Tom's River. Try to figure out why such awful things could happen in a community in which people had such a clear sense of what their community was, was all about. And as, as I started to dig into this, I really got into the history. Uh, you know, the Cedar plant is just the end line of a, of a, a multi-century old process that began, you can think of it beginning at different times and in different ways, but the guy I, I like to pick uh, is William Henry Perkin. He was sort of the, the Mark Zuckerberg of his day. He was a chemistry student at the Royal College of Chemistry. Uh, and he was given an assignment uh, over spring break by his professor, not to party in uh, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, but, but to try to figure out if he could synthesize a, a, an alternative to quinine as a treatment for malaria. He failed, he couldn't make it work, but he did notice something amazing that when he poured this liquid out of his test tube, it was a spectacular sh shade of purple. And it, it, it adhered to the glass really well. And when he poured it on cloth, it, it adhered beautifully to the cloth. And purple was not just any color, it was the color of royalty because it was so precious, so hard to find natural sources uh, of purple. Perkin dropped out of college, just like Mark Zuckerman dropped, uh, Zuckerberg dropped out of uh, Harvard and founded a chemical company. His ideas quickly spread. Uh, Basel, Switzerland became the headquarters of the new chemical industry. Companies that started out making dyes, uh, aniline dyes, the A in BASF, the A in SIVA, uh, the A in Bayer, uh, all are about aniline dyes. And I had no idea, I didn't know that all uh, the entire chemical industry, that, began, that it started with dyes before it expanded to plastics uh, and to other synthetic polymers. So that was news to me. And it was also clear very early that there was a real downside to this chemical revolution. This is a cartoon from Punch. Uh, called the arsenic waltz in which you see skeletons uh, dancing. And that was based on the fact that when women would buy these purple stained, 
purple dyed uh, stockings or men would, would wear purple, the dye would bleed off and it was very accurate and it would have both acute and long-term effects. It was, it was extremely toxic. This second photo here uh, is of workers at a dye plant and it's too bad that it's a black and white photo because it was, if it was color, you could have seen whatever dye color they were working on that day. And there were horrific consequences to working at a dye plant. Uh, uh, terrible clusters of cancer, especially bladder cancers. This, of course, is the Tom's River plant. Uh, and as I said, by the time uh, Siba, Agaigi, and Sandoz, you know, their partnership moved uh, to Tom's River, they already had a very clear idea that, that what they were working on was really dangerous. Uh, uh, at the Cincinnati Chemical Works, which was the previous big dye plant that they had in the U.S., you know, there were some uh, production lines where every single worker uh, developed bladder cancer, which is really stunning if you think about it. So the Tom's River plan, if you've seen it between the trees, you see the old water tower, you see that at one point it was a, it was a huge city uh, all of its own. Uh, at its peak, 1,300 employees, a $35 million payroll, 3 billion pounds of dyes and plastics produced uh, from 52 to 86, which after that things really started to, to trend downward. But the thing is that, that dyes and plastics were not really the main product of the SEPA plant uh, in Tom's River. Waste was the biggest product by far. 40 billion gallons of wastewater, a couple hundred thousand drums of toxic waste, that's probably an underestimate. It was an incredibly inefficient, highly wasteful process. It generated a massive amount of pollution. And if you've been looking at the map behind me as I've been talking, this is the map. I'm not going to go into all the detail because I just, I, re I really want to move through here uh, quickly. But, you know, just to point out a couple of things to get you oriented. Here's the Garden State. Uh, here's Tom's River. Here, of course, is beautiful Barnegat Bay. Here are the, the shore communities. And here is the chemical plant. And all those dark spaces are waste uh, dumping sites. Here's the Black Lagoon in the headwaters of the Tom's River, where there was a huge amount of dumping in the, in the 60s. Uh, and the dumping was so heavy that the, the volume of wastewater added to the, the Tom's here, which way up here in the river is really more like a creek, the wastewater outnumbered the actual river water. Uh, it, was a, it was a majority waste uh, creek up here at least. And this second area I wanted to show you, these are the Holly Street wells. So if you know Tom's River, those, that's the old well field. It slurped up all that waste that came down the Tom's River, uh, slurped it up through the sandy banks of the river, distributed it all over town. And in the 60s, the water tasted funny. And some people knew why, especially if they worked at the chemical plant and they were managers at the chemical plant because they had tasted that taste in their water uh, from the wells that were right at the chemical plant. So what did they do? Well, they decided rather than alert the whole, whole town that contaminated water was being distributed, they would quietly tell the water company and they would move the chemical plant's own water wells to different spots. So at least at the chemical plant, they would get clean water even if the rest of the town didn't. The other thing, after they told the water company about it, they came up with a, a plan to essentially build a pipeline to shove a lot of that wastewater along Bay Avenue, across Barnegat Bay, and out into the Atlantic. That pipeline later leaked twice uh, in the 80s, uh, once near the shopping mall, once elsewhere. And it became a huge, huge issue but for decades, SEBA uh, shipped a tremendous amount of its wastewater out into the ocean. And the thinking was, well, the solution to pollution is dilution, right? So the ocean's a big place, so let's just shove it all out there. 
and it was uh, just an appalling uh, decision. And by the way, it wasn't just SEBA's waste. There was so much excess capacity in this pipeline that SEBA imported wastewater, toxic wastewater from uh, mm. as far up as Newark uh, and uh, charged those companies to get rid of their waste also. The second, the last thing I want to show you on this map is here's the newer well field that still exists. You can see it as if you look through the trees as you drive by the parkway. It was built in part as a response to all the contamination at Holly Street and also because the, the town was growing so fast. The problem there was that there was another dump site right here, Reich Farm, which is an old chicken farm. And Mr. Reich wanted to make a little extra money, so he agreed to let a guy throw a bunch of barrels uh, in the back of his property. Uh, it's not clear exactly how much he realized, uh, how much dumping was, whether he knew how much dumping was going on. But for a period of almost a year, there was a tremendous amount of waste dumped. Those barrels were leaky. They came from the Union Carbide plant way up north. Uh, the parkway wells slurped up that waste in the 70s and distributed that waste all over town on into the 80s and even the 90s. So there were two waves of contamination via water in Tom's River, as well as the air pollution from the stacks at the SEBA plant. Okay, thank you for bearing with that uh, explanation. A couple other quick things I want to mention. This is Linda Gillick. Uh, Linda is uh, one of the heroes of this story. Uh, she, her son uh, was diagnosed with neuroblastoma, Michael, when he was quite young. Uh, Michael beat the odds and is alive today. Uh, and uh, he and his mom continue to be activists for a cleaner environment as well as providing really important support to uh, families that are affected by childhood cancer. Uh, their group is called Oceans of Love, and as Grace Ann mentioned, they're a wonderful group. This is a, a map that she put together. Uh, she was not a shy retiring person. If you know Linda, she's not like that. Uh, and she started asking around and, and developed a network of, of parents and she got concerned that there were a lot of cases in Tom's River. She wrote to the state health department, the state health department ignored her. There was a lot of pushback from fellow residents of the town. There was a lot of denial that, that what Linda was saying couldn't be true. Ocean County was one of the fastest growing counties in New Jersey, at the, at, sorry, in the whole country at that time. You can see from this graph here that from the mid 50s to the mid 70s, it was growing like crazy. Housing prices were soaring, developments were being built everywhere. As a result, there was a tremendous amount of pushback that Linda got when she started to publicize her concerns. Here's a note that was put in her mailbox. The water's fine, the cancer cluster's probably a freak. Meantime, Ocean County will suffer this summer because you've scared away tourists, home buyers, and others. So that's, the essence of denial. This is Lisa Bornazian. Uh, she, at the time, was a nurse at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She saw a lot of cases of childhood cancer. When you're a nurse working in a really tough situation like pediatric oncology, especially at that time, we have much better cure rates now, survival rates now, but back then in the 70s and 80s and 90s, it wasn't nearly as good. Uh, Lisa went to a lot of funerals. She bonded with families and she noticed that, you know, CHOP gets patients from all over the country, all over the world, but there were a lot of kids from Tom's River and she would go to funerals and, and it really concerned her. She talked to the physicians at CHOP. They said, well, it's probably a coincidence. Don't worry about it, just do your job. But her sister-in-law worked for the EPA and she was talking to her sister-in-law one day and the sister-in-law knew who to call. And the next thing you knew, uh, uh, the state health department had agreed to do a basic analysis of cancer rates in Tom's River compared to the statewide rate. Here's what they found. Uh, there was a 50% more childhood cancer in, Tom, in the core zone of Tom's River. There was 80% more leukemia uh, brain cancer and septal nervous system cancer, there was three times more than what would be expected 
based on the statewide uh, rates. And for young children, seven times more. So that's a lot. And then when the state looked at this, analyzed this data and found that every SIR, that's just a, a, a standardized incidence ratio, that's, that's just a rate, calculated for Dover Township, Towns River, was higher than expected. But because of the small number of cases in the analysis, it's not possible to study this. So in other words, yeah, something's going on in Tom's River, but there's really nothing that we can do about it. So we're not going to. In fact, they decided that they wouldn't even tell. They wouldn't even do a press release or release this information in any way. But Libby Gillick found out about it, as did some other people, and it spread the way that stories do until it got to the largest newspaper in the state, the Star Ledger, which a terrific reporter named Gail Scott really raised hell about it. She got that she invest, investigated it thoroughly. She wrote a series of stories. And then as some people on this call remember, all hell broke loose in Tom's River. There were very intense meetings, a lot of screaming. The police were called. Uh, the state health de uh, department director uh, felt literally besieged in, in one famous meeting. But in the end, uh, he, the state health commissioner and the governor, who at the time was Christy Whitman, uh, agreed to do a comprehensive study. It took a long time to do that study. And, and it was a fascinating piece of work that I explain in the book. And in the end, it came to a remarkable conclusion. Namely, that there was a st statistically significant dose response relationship between air pollution from the SIBA plant and childhood leukemia, at least some, depending on some demographics of childhood leukemia, and also between uh, contamination of the parkway well fields. Uh, and again, relationship to childhood leukemia, especially in girls. Uh, that was amazing because it's very hard to do these kinds of studies and find anything, especially for childhood cancer, which is still relatively rare. So there's a lot of statistical noise. It's really hard to find the signal in the noise. There was also a, a civil, uh, was never actually a lawsuit. It wasn't filed, but there was an elaborate negotiation that led to settlements for many of the families involved. You'd have a good discussion about, you know, some families actually got more than 400, but, but not a lot more than 400,000. And we could have a good discussion about whether $400,000, even back then, was appropriate compensation for everything that those families went through. So that's not where the book ends. Uh, uh, the chemical industry moved first from New Jersey uh, to Louisiana and the American South, and then ultimately to China. China is now the source of 80% of the world's chemical manufacturing. So at the end of the book, I went go to Chongqing, which is a, a heavily industrialized city. Here's a, a photo of it. It's just a medium-sized city by Chinese standards. It has 20 million plus people in the metro area. <laughs> but by Chinese standards, that's not that big. Uh, this building up here is Chongqing uh, Children's Hospital. One of the floors is the pediatric uh, oncology ward, one of the ones near the top. And I went there and interviewed a bunch of families, and it was shocking to me and disturbing and also illuminating uh, how many of the families there connected their kids' problems to it, their own exposure in the workplace, especially to chemical manufacturing. So in the end, the question is, we got Basel, we've got Tom's River, we've got Chongqing. You know, are we fated for this cycle just to continue to repeat itself? You know, there are Linda Gillicks in China now uh, uh, trying to bring attention to this problem. They have a big advantage, one advantage and one big disadvantage. The big advantage is the internet exists now and it's possible to share information in ways that we couldn't before. The big disadvantage is they're trying to do it in a totalitarian state where the internet is tightly controlled. 
So it's not easy. So are we fated to this? I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, a lot of people, pe pe people react to my book in different ways. Some people find it uplifting. Some people find it discouraging. I find it, I think it's a, a success story. That's why I say that's the salvation and in a story of science and salvation. This is uh, a graph of childhood leukemia rates in Tom's River compared to the statewide rate, which is the dotted line here. This graphic is a little out of date now, uh, but the Tom's River, the childhood leukemia rate in child Tom's River has stayed below the statewide average after being way above it for many, many years. What happened here? The plant closed, the air emissions stopped, the well fields were either closed or appropriately filtered finally. So to me, the lesson of Tom's River is that public health interventions work. They really do. We can make a difference. And I even think that my, I, I had nothing to do with this. Uh, these, this is all about Lindy Gillick, uh, not just Lindy Gillick, Lisa Bernazian, some of the people on this call, uh, uh, Sheila McVeigh's on this call, I hear, and Stephanie Waters, Michelle Donato, lots of other people uh, all played a role in making Tom's River a safer place than it used to be. Uh, and to me, that's a very encouraging message. And as for my book, I think that these kinds of stories can really play a role. You know, when I, when I first went back to Tom's River after the book was published, the librarian told me to bring a football helmet. And I thought that was kind of alarming that a librarian would tell me that, you know, librarians are, are gentle people. Uh, uh, and I thought, wow, what, I don't know what to expect. But that first day that I went back to the library and gave a, a talk after the book was published, I don't know if any of you were there, but, but it was actually wonderful for me to hear people talk about how affirmed they felt that their story was being told and that, that what they had gone through would not be wasted, you know, that, that people could learn from this story. And all the things that have happened to this book since then, you know, Chinese version, there might be a movie. Yeah, that's Danny DeVito. Don't get too excited. I'm trying not to get too excited. This is Hollywood and, and the odds are always against you, but he's trying to, uh, He's got a script writer and he's, he's trying to turn this thing into a movie. And to me, all of that says that people want, they have the capacity to learn from the past. They have the capacity to move beyond denial. And that's what, that's why I wrote the book, you know. This is the Children's Memorial Garden uh, at Winding River Park in Tom's River. There's another memorial to the kids uh, uh, downtown in the, the park right on the river. I've forgotten the name of, of that, that park. River, Riverfront Landing, I think it's called. Uh, that's what this is really all about, that it, something terrible happened in Tom's River. And, and in, in my opinion, it was entirely preventable. And it happened because people either weren't paying attention or because they just refused to acknowledge the reality uh, that they were facing. And, and here we are in, an, in the middle of an epic uh, public health crisis in which the same kind of denial is occurring and the same kind of disrespect and ignoring of science. And, and we're all suffering the consequences of that. And so I feel like the lessons of this story are, are more important than ever. So with that, uh, I'll stop. And I'm happy to discuss anything that this, this uh, very well-informed audience wants to talk about. Thank you, Dan. Um, so I, I just want to start off with, um, certainly I found a few talks on YouTube. So I know the answer, but I know others want to know. <laughs> why you chose Tom's River, this story, and then how long, like you discovered the story, but then you didn't write about it in, initially, and how long did it take to get this project done? Yeah, so I'm, I'm a slow worker. <laughs> I 
I believe in being thorough and I luckily have the kind of job that gives me the freedom to do that. Uh, but when I started this, I wasn't a professor. I, I was a reporter uh, for Newsday on Long Island uh, and in New York City. And I was the environmental reporter. And if you're an environmental reporter uh, in New York, downstate New York anyway, as, as in New Jersey, you're not spending a lot of time writing about wide open spaces. Yes, there are beautiful natural areas in New Jersey and, and even on Long Island. Uh, but most of the time you're writing about environmental health, environmental risk. So I wrote a lot about cancer and the environment. People were constantly telling me, asking me, why is there so much cancer on my block? So much cancer at the post office where I work, whatever. So I got really interested in epidemiology and, and everyone is talking about epidemiology these days. It's, it's very weird and exciting for someone like me, an epidemiology Greek, a geek. I was really interested in, you know, how do we know what we know about the relationship between uh, chronic diseases, especially cancer, and the environment? And on what basis do we know this and, and what don't we know? So I got really interested in that. And I wrote a bunch of stories on Long Island about breast cancer and the environment. And there was a big study that the federal government did in response to that but it was a really poor study. It wasn't well designed and it ended ambiguously, which could have been preordained, uh, you know, not preordained, but it was preordained based on the poor design. Uh, and that was very frustrating. And so at that point, I really wanted to look for an example of somebody that was doing this better, you know, where better science was being done, real science, uh, and I had heard about Tom's River. And so I went, drove down, and I met uh, some of the characters in the book. I met Linda, uh, and I met Jerry Fagliano, and I met Jane Schlickman, uh, later portrayed by John Travolta in Civil Action. And I thought to myself, wow, this is a great story. And, and I also knew that a really good case control epi study was being done. So I told myself, if I ever get a chance to write a book, this would be a good one. And soon after, I went to NYU and became a professor. And the first thing they tell you is, you need to write a book right away. Uh, and I said, well, I've got a book idea. Uh, and of course, it took me much longer than expected. And I did these deep dives into uh, history and I did a lot of traveling and tried to tell the story comprehensively. So it was really almost seven years by the time I was finished. So it took a long time, but yeah. that's how I got into it. Where was the story when you, where were we in the, in the period of time when the book got published? How long out were we from the case? Uh, so I did the reporting. I first started reporting for, for Newsday for my newspaper. When, when I first met these guys, it was uh, uh, 2001. Uh, is that right? Yes. Um, yes, it was 2001. And I started writing the book in 07. Uh, so there, there, were, there, were, there were a few years there in, in between. I think I started writing the book in 06. Uh, yeah, that's right. I started writing the book in 06. And I first heard about it in 01. And so some of the, in the final chapter, some of the things that I described, I actually saw contemporaneously. But the rest relies on a whole lot of interviews, including some interviews with people who are in this group. Uh, Stephanie, Michelle, Sheila, maybe, maybe others, I don't know. Uh, but I, I, I wound up doing more than 150 interviews. It was a lot. Wow. Um, so what were some of the, I'm just going to, so for the audience, I'd like to, I have a few questions of my own that I have from reading the book and also from one person that emailed me, but if you have questions, please drop them in the chat so that we can um, get, get in that flow. Uh, and so I'm curious to know what some of the roadblocks were. There had to be some throughout this story. Oh yes. <laughs> there were a lot of roadblocks. Uh, uh, I mean, 
the most important probably was that you know, a lot of people really were just were not interested in talk, talking to me about this. And, and I would say there were really two reasons. Uh, one way more understandable than another than the other. Uh, the, one, the one that was very understandable were the people who had gone through, you know, sort of wrenching pain, personal pain. They lost a child to cancer or there was cancer in their family and they just didn't want to talk about this anymore. And, and I, of course, I completely understand that. I have two kids myself. I can't even imagine what, a, what it could possibly have been like for them. So I totally respect that. Uh, the second reason may be less defensible, which is that people said, well, why are you dredging up this ugly thing that happened in our town? You're gonna just drive down our real estate values. You know, a lot of the same things that happened first in the, in the 80s when uh, Michelle Donato and people like that were raising hell. And, and then in the 90s, when Linda was raising hell, you know, uh, reporters get that a lot too. So there was that. It was really a complicated story. So it, it took a lot of time to just try to understand, you know, there was a, a huge amount of records. Uh, there are two, two sites in town that both spread contamination throughout uh, Tom's River, uh, throughout the township, uh, through the water system and in the air. And there's a massive amount of documentation associated with both of those sites, uh, Reich Farm and the Sibigaigi plant. And I spent a lot of time in the library. Uh, there's just a wall, a shelf, just loaded with EPA documents. I don't know if it's still there anymore at the main library in Tom's River. They had a funny name for it, but now I've forgotten. The Wall of Shame, that's it. They call it the Wall of Shame. And so there was a tremendous amount of document work to do too. Plus I had to use the Freedom of Information Act to get a lot of information that the EPA uh, and the CDC and other places didn't really want to give me. So all that took time. So we have a steady flow of questions coming in. So I'm going to wrap my questions in wherever I can find a good place. So we have one um, and it, so I'm hoping you can kind of cover both things at once. Um, so when we talk about water in our system, you know, we have drinking water is usually treated before it comes to the home, or at least that's what my understanding was. And so I, I want to wrap the question of how it got out of, basically, how was it coming out of the wells and not being found, these toxic chemicals? And then this question from one of the audience members, um, is asking, would everyone in Tom's River have gotten the water from Holly Street, like those of us in Ortley Beach or Normandy Beach? She was wondering, you know, what the what the birth of that Holly Street well was. Yeah. So, so that's those are two really good questions. Um, the book, I hope, explains uh, the answers to both. And and the the answer to the first question is. Uh, you know, why wasn't it detected or why was anything done about it? Part of the problem was that these were really strange compounds. They were not standard Clean Water Act contaminants. The Sibigaigi plant generated a lot of weird stuff and, and the dumping on Reich Farm, similarly, that was Union Carbide Waste. Those were some really unusual compounds. Uh, and not all of them were unusual, uh, the ones that weren't, that, that were more common, uh, they were removed, uh, but the ones that were weird uh, often weren't removed. Also, the Tom's River Water Company really did a, a lousy job, you know, through the 60s, 70s, and 80s in, in affirmatively trying to get a handle on this. You know, the, the CBGAGI folks knew way more about these compounds than the water company did. And the water company really did a poor job, in my opinion, of, of trying to serve the public interest. Uh, uh, and so the filtration and other controls were, were, were really terrible, uh, really poor. Uh, as to the second question, 
One of the things that was done as part of the case control study is that the various parts of the town were sort of put into different exposure categories, depending on where, how much Holly Street water they got, and also how much Parkway water they got. And in, so different parts of town got more or less. Uh, and, and one of the goals of this water model was to figure that out. As for Ortley and La Valette and the ocean communities, I do not think they got any uh, Tom's River public water. I, I think they had their own separate uh, water system, but I'm not absolutely certain. Um, so I have another question uh, that I knew was coming and I always ask myself and what effects did this pollution have on Barnegat Bay and the Atlantic Ocean? Now obviously you wrote more on the human health side of things but are you aware yeah. of any any other studies that yeah. were going on? So people have tried to figure this out. Um, uh, it is very difficult to do. Uh, if you if you look at, around the pipeline uh, the the biota in the, in the immediate vicinity of the vents of the pipeline, uh, either, either the leaks uh, on land in which you see different microbial life uh, or uh, in the ocean, there were no leaks in the bay that anyone ever found. It doesn't mean that they didn't exist, uh, but it went across the bay and into the ocean where the outlet vents were and, and the biota there, the marine life in the immediate vicinity of those outlets, you, there was definitely a difference. But exactly how to quantify that was, was very tough to do. It was a tough environment down there. And, and this, this would have been in the 80s uh, and 90s, especially the 80s, uh, 70s and 80s, where there just wasn't a lot of sort of sophisticated science happening, uh, it, it, was, it was much rougher than that. So the bottom line is, I was, I was mocking the sort of idea of the solution to pollution is dilution, but the truth is the ocean is a very diluted environment. And so in no way justifies the atrocious decision to, to put millions of gallons of wastewater in, into the ocean every day. Uh, but it is not easy to find clear effects because the ocean is such a big place. There, there were various experiments involving brine shrimp, uh, sort of very famously, uh, that I describe in the book. And uh, this thing definitely killed brine shrimp uh, it, you know, in a laboratory setting. But seeing that, in the actual ocean is very difficult to, to it's very difficult to to do. And so there wasn't either in the Tom's River as well, right? Because they were they were pushing out flow into the river itself. But I guess that was much earlier. Even that was before. earlier, although even after they built this waste pipeline, there was still a lot of waste that wound up uh, in the river itself. There were definitely fish kills, you know, the 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 exposures were definitely the worst in the late 50s and early 60s. Uh, and there were, there were absolutely fish kills uh, at that time in the Thomas River. I described this in the book. Later on, uh, it became much more difficult to identify specific uh, impacts in the river, especially once you get past the bridge and the river starts to really open up on the way to Barnegat Bay, the, the flow is, is, is more diluted at that point. There's, there's more activity, there's, there's more churn. And so it, it's harder to see the biological changes. But at the headwaters of the Tons River, where there was this tremendous volume of wastewater from the plant going into this little creek, the creek smelled, it looked bad, there were fish kills. Uh, and, well, this is, this is a story too. Uh, at, at one point uh, in the late 50s, the SEBA the, the folks decided they would build a fish pond uh, to show, to demonstrate that the water was clean enough 
that fish could swim in it. Uh, the fish immediately died uh, in that fish pond. They tried one more time, the fish died again, and then they stopped using the fish pond uh, as, as part of their, uh, uh, even, you know, uh, emission process. So yeah, there, there were absolutely effects, but they're not always easy to measure, at least since the mid 60s. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, so we have a, a question asking, we have a Pine Lake Park resident, and so they're asking about were the cases downstream, and so can you kind of touch on the difference between surface water and groundwater and kind of go over that a little bit? Yeah, Pinewood Park is an interesting case because it, it, it's, it's not really directly downstream of, of, the, of the plume, at least not what I remember. Uh, I would really be reluctant to, 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 to say here that one particular neighborhood was highly exposed or, or, or low exposed. It really depends on exactly where the location is and what years we're talking about. But that's what really happened in the case control study, you know, which is a public document. You can get it at the Ocean County Library. And you can see which parts of town in, you know, inclu certainly including Pinewood Park, uh, uh, were highly exposed and when. Uh, and and that, that would give an answer to that question. Awesome. It's, it, it's so, you know, one of the reasons that cancer epidemiology is so tough is, is that you have to go back into the distant past because, you know, with COVID, right, we can, we can do contact tracing. We can see in real time how something is spreading. That's, uh, you know, acute epidemiology, infectious disease epidemiology. Chronic epidemiology, chronic disease epidemiology is way harder because there's this long latency period with cancer. Many years can pass before uh, the cell division of cancer gets big enough that, that you can detect it with, you know, in an MRI or, or an X-ray or, or whatever it is that you're using. Uh, so that means that we somehow have to go way back into the past once we see a cluster and try to figure out what, what happened. And that's what, that's what this case control study attempted to do. And it was really quite amazing how they put it all together. I'm not gonna try to explain it all here, but it's in the book. <laughs> I listened to it again, I, it was just, and I had to like go over it again and again, it's just so involved. Um, and so perfect segue into our politics. Uh, what do you um, think that the EPA's effectiveness in managing the investigations and the cleanup was? So it definitely depends on, on when, you know, when, when we're talking about. Uh, generally speaking, the earlier the period, the, the, the less effective. Uh, you know, in, in the 50s, there, of course, there was no federal involvement in the 50s and the 60s. There were virtually no federal involvement. It was all about the county and the state, and the county and the state were atrociously bad at regulating the plant. And in fact, they just weren't really interested in regulating the plant at all. Uh, you know, it was they they saw it as an engine of economic development. You know, the state health department people were very clear about this and they didn't want to interfere with it in any way. Uh, so the EPA was created in the early 70s and uh, in the early 70s, there started to be some significant federal enforcement, especially focused on the plant and illegal dumping at the plant. There were some criminal prosecutions. Uh, so things started to pick up, but still atrociously, amazingly, all through the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s, well into the 90s, toxic uh, compounds at low but far from minuscule levels uh, were distributed through the town. And it's hard to say that the agencies were uh, it's not that they were breaking the law by failing to act, but they were being so passive and, and you know, just so uh, uninterested. Uh, 
And, you know, again, we're not talking about the 60s and the 70s before we had much environmental law. This was well into the 80s and 90s uh, that these exposures were continuing. And it's really quite, quite shocking. So can you just kind of go over briefly um, the reason why statistical significance is so important in this book? Because you speak to the fact that Tom's River is a unique case, actually, in that like the whole story was able to kind of have some closure, whereas there's these stories across the United States and the world that are not getting this closure. So if you can kind of touch on that, that would be awesome. Yeah. So that's true. You know, uh, there are different ways to look at what happened in Tom's River. Uh, you could think of it as a mirage, which means that, you know, this study claims to have found a, a relationship uh, between exposure to these chem chemicals and likelihood to develop childhood cancer. But you know what? those relationships can be uh, illusory. They, they can be, uh, they can be not there. You know, sometimes we see patterns and they're not really patterns. They're, they're simply coincidence. So it's somehow possible, it's theoretically possible that, that Tom's River was just a big fake uh, and, and that, and that, uh, it was just a really weird coincidence that childhood cancer rates across the board were so high and that the rates were highest where exposure to air emissions from the plant and water from the parkway wells were highest. I, I don't believe that for a second, but, but it's possible. So that's possibility number one, mirage. Possibility number two is, is uh, the freak uh, possibility. And that is that the reason that we haven't seen more Tom's Rivers uh, it, it, is that they don't really exist. That this was the one place where uh, pollution was, was so prevalent uh, that uh, we could see the fingerprint uh, in uh, childhood cancer cases. That's even less likely than the freak uh, possibility. Uh, it's it's, there's no way, uh, exposures were not that high in Tom's River compared to other highly polluted areas. Tom's River was not a highly polluted area. It wasn't then and it isn't now. It's just that people paid attention to it. They looked, which really gets us to the third possibility, possibility number three, which is that Tom's River is a, is a warning that the only surprising thing about what happened in Tom's River was that we found out about it. And why did we find out about it? Because enough people over the generations raised hell uh, and uh, got the community interested and focused on and concerned ab about what was happening and essentially forced uh, the State Health Department, and then the Centers for Disease Control and the, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, a, a, federal, a, a very obscure federal agency that does important work, basically forced these agencies to do a comprehensive study, uh, which then identified these statistically significant dose-responsive relationships that we almost never see. Uh, to me, the third possibility that it's a warning is by far the most likely uh, result. Uh, there's every reason to think that there are lots of Tom's Rivers out there. Tom's River is not unusual. Its pollution was not that unusual. There are lots of other uh, industrialized areas, suburban slash industrialized areas that have these exposures. It's just that in Tom's River, people raised enough hell uh, and forced uh, state and federal agencies to look. I mean, the, what's amazing is that we just don't look. And we're even less likely to look to, to study cancer clusters now than we were 20 years ago. Uh, public agencies are not interested in looking at this problem. Uh, they consider it uh, too expensive 
and they step on too many toes, powerful toes, and they get in, uh, they, they rile up uh, citizens, and to what end? Uh, to me, there was a wonderful end to Tom's River uh, in, in the sense that you saw it with that decline in leukemia cases. Uh, but that costs a lot of money uh, and a lot of pain, a lot of stress, a lot of agita uh, to, to get to that point. And very few communities are willing to take that on and even fewer public agencies are willing to give in to the pressure and, and to that kind of science. And then too, the statistical, you mean proving that statistical significance is so, it seemed through your book that it was really difficult to do. Right, that's a, that's a, that's a separate problem, but it's one of the reasons that public agencies give for not investigating clusters. And it's, it's not just, it's not a, an excuse. I mean, I mean, in some cases it's used as an excuse, but, but it, it's a good reason. Um, if a disease is rare and childhood, first of all, you can't really, you don't really study childhood cancer as a group because cancer is not one disease, it's 200 plus diseases. They each have their own ideology, their own progression, their, you know, their own causes. So their own risk factors, I should say. So the idea of, of studying a cluster, you really need plenty of cases in order to, to study this. Just like if you're testing a COVID vaccine or of COVID therapy, you really need to test it on a lot of people in, in order to figure out whether it's effective or not in order to figure out what the cause is, the cause and the result. Just like if you're doing a, an opinion poll, you know, who's gonna, who's gonna be president uh, or whatever, who's gonna win New Jersey, uh, who's gonna win New Jersey's electoral votes. You can't poll five people and, and think that you're gonna get uh, uh, a reliable result. So it's very tough to do these studies of diseases where there are relatively few cases. And even in Thomas River, uh, where there was a lot of childhood cancer. And even if you lumped ver you know, groupings of childhood cancer together, the actual numbers per year, there might be three or four cases when maybe one case was expected. It's really tough when the numbers are that small to try to figure out whether you're seeing something real or, or, or something that is just a coincidence. And, and uh, that is something that I explained so you perfect segue into the next question, um, and I'll just read it verbatim. Willie DeCamp is our president, and he says, uh, would you say that public officials were finally swayed more by the incoming science or more by public opinion around SIBA? And is there a message for today with respect to government action on COVID-19? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well, there really wasn't any science early on in, in 96 uh, when, uh, when the community was really worked up. Uh, so it wasn't that the health department, the health department had seen that sort of very basic analysis that suggested there was way more cancer than expected in Tom's River. Uh, that was very basic science, just a, a basic statistical analysis. And the health department looked at that, those numbers and said, well, this is not worth studying, sorry. Uh, and then kept it secret. Uh, and then had to reverse itself, you know, under orders from, from Governor Whitman, only when the public raised serious hell about it. So, you know, only, only when this became a, a, you know, a huge emergency in Tom's River. You know, there, were, there was a period of weeks in Tom's River where you could not get bottled water. You know, you had to drive for miles and miles and miles. There are probably people on this call who remember that. Uh, and, and people were in an absolute panic uh, after the story got out. And in that context, the questioner is absolutely right. It was public pressure that led to the, the study. One of the interesting things that happened is that, is that once the study was underway, people calmed down. 
uh, you know, they really just wanted to be listened to. They wanted to feel like somebody was really looking at this. When the study was finally completed, the state uh, had prepared this sort of very elaborate public communication strategy. They were expecting thousands of people to show up and, and be either you know, furious or elated or, or ambivalent because uh, the results were not, they were really fascinating, but they were not crystal clear. And really that didn't happen. Um, it wasn't that the study landed with more of a whimper than a bang, even though to me it was really a very important study. And I do think that there's an important lesson there. And that is that public agencies need to listen to the public and take their concerns seriously and act on those concerns. But that doesn't mean that the science, you know, has to be somehow gained to get a particular result. It, it doesn't. Uh, the public just wants to feel like government is responding to their concerns. Uh, and, and that's what happened in this case. Once the science got going, things calmed down uh, in Tom's River. And, and I think that's a, a great lesson. To me, it's quite similar to the testing debate now with COVID. You know, the president has said over and over, oh, we, we don't want to expand testing because if we test more, we'll, we'll have more cases, you know, which is absurd, completely absurd, as if those cases don't exist if we don't test for them. You know, it's, 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 uh, it's idiotic. But it speaks to this uh, tendency of government to just sort of try to calm things down and keep people quiet uh, and not put out information and, 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 you know, not take public concerns seriously and instead try to treat it as a public relations problem that just needs to be tamped down, tamped down. And that's what I meant with that slide about sunlight being the best disinfectant, you know, you got to get this stuff out there in, into the public sphere and you have to be honest with people. How many cases do we really have? And then once people feel like you're taking their concerns seriously, they're not gonna uh, panic. They're gonna feel like, okay, the government is being responsive. This is the situation we find ourselves in and we're gonna deal with it. And, and I actually think that in New York State and New Jersey, there was very, April and May were very tough, obviously. And there were plenty of uh, missteps by both governors. But since then, I think both governors have done a pretty good job of being much more transparent uh, and, and doing everything they can to promote uh, testing and contact tracing, although contact tracing has been really tough. But they've really been models for the rest of the country, once you get to June, uh, models for the rest of the country about how to take public concerns seriously and how to be transparent. and and you know, generate as much information for the public as you possibly can. And that happened in Tom's River too, eventually. Uh, unfortunately, it took a lot of deaths, uh, a lot of tragedy before we got to that point. So one of the things I've heard you say in other interviews and I hear you saying it now is, is that you wrote this story, not just to um, you know, tell the story of Tom's River, but to also have that ability to tell the, the, oh, the kind of the theme and that, you know, people getting involved and waking up about the issues is how we're going to solve this. So it's been about seven years since the book got published, right, give or take. Um, have you seen any rippling effects in other communities? The book is widely read now. It's translated into Chinese, um, in two different Chinese um, mm -hmm. dialects, right? Uh, so, you know, like, have you seen any, anyone wake up and say, uh, we can do something in our community based on the story you told about Tom River? Yeah, I would, I would, I would certainly like to think so. Uh, I, I get emails every week, uh, multiple emails every week from all over the world, people telling me about their own situation. Uh, can I do anything about it? And usually my answer is, is no, because I... I don't pontificate about things that I don't know about. So I, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't know what to say about you know, the Superfund side or, or the, the particular pollution problem that you know, they're, they're writing me about. But I do find it very encouraging that people are reading this book and they're learning from it and they're 
recognizing their community in Tom's River and they are petitioning their government for redress, you know, which is right there in the First Amendment uh, that, you know, in this country we have the right to do that. And in other countries, they're at least seeking that, those rights. Sometimes it's disappointing that, that uh, they're, they are disappointed that they're shut down by their government. Uh, but people are surprisingly persistent. And I, I do hear those stories a lot uh, from different places around the US and, and also around the world. And in China, you don't really get a lot of emails from China because the, the email is censored, but I have gotten some. Uh, and uh, there are ways that, that they can communicate and, and get around the Great Firewall, as it's called. Uh, so that's been particularly encouraging to me. Uh, I, I think that the Chinese, in some ways, Chinese citizens are a real model for us. You know, they, they are facing a much tougher situation. Their environment is much worse. They're facing an authoritarian government. Uh, and yet they're really quite determined. You know, there's, there's a movement called the Cancer Villages Movement. It's actually focused in the rural areas. And the reason is, the reason is because in the urban areas, there are so many people that it's impossible to try to get a sense of what's actually happening in the community. But in these rural areas, some of which are quite industrialized, people are doing the Linda Gillick thing and, and they're, they're making little maps of uh, exposures and, and they're agitating uh, for the local health department or the provincial health department to get involved. And it's very encouraging to me uh, that, that this is happening. And the Chinese government is in some ways responsive. You know, they, they're worried about their long-term legitimacy very much worried about that. And, and so they, they're responsive to this movement, sometimes in the sense of cracking down on it, but other times in, in, in actually agreeing to do, to clean things up uh, and to do the kinds of analyses that are really helpful. Go sit down. Now they can't talk for some reason. Hang on, just mute. If you're not muted, if you can just mute your, um, here we go. Okay. So, um, the, so the, and I got distracted now. <laughs> uh, we, um, we have a question from someone who's on the call. Uh, she sent it in earlier and, um, she just kind of segued to that, to, to the China piece. She was asking if you plan to write about those stories and just for the for those of you on the call who may not have read the book um these chemical plants that were here in tom's river and i say these as in the different iterations that they were have now moved to asia and so um obviously that's what dan gets into at the end of the book kind of traveling to china um and so one of the questions was if you're going to tell that story of you know the continuation there and if not maybe if you want to highlight the other stories that you are telling now in regards to your work? Uh, well, uh, you know, the answer is, is no. Uh, I, you know, I spent seven plus years on this story and it was uh, exhausting and, and I felt some need, I guess, to, to, to move on. Uh, so I'm doing something that in some ways is completely different, but in some ways isn't. I'll show you a, a, a photograph to sort of give you a, a, a sense of what I'm talking about. Uh, we did have a question about your monarch books. Is it yeah, well, that's what I was gonna, that's what I was gonna uh, tell about. Uh, so. Hopefully Christine is still on. Yeah, can you see it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so, so this is a spectacular place. Uh, it, it's a really out of the way site in uh, Michoacan or actually in the, uh, the state of Mexico, uh, right on the border of Michoacan. Those are all individual monarch butterflies. Uh, I find them uh, amazing creatures. They they're, are certainly the most 
they're probably right up there with elephants as the most beloved and sort of concert. They're the focus of more conservation work by more people than any other uh, uh, wild creature uh, in the world. I find that really interesting. Uh, but more than that, you know, as with the Thomas River book, what really interests me are, are really big problems and then finding interesting ways to, to write about those problems. I did that, I found Tom's River to write about the big problem of what is the relationship between the environment and cancer? How do we know what we know and what can we do about it? And Tom's River was my vehicle, my way of, of writing about that. Well, monarch butterflies are my way of writing about the problems of the Anthropocene. And this is a sophisticated group, so probably a number of you have heard about this concept of the Anthropocene. And that is the idea that in the whole history of the planet, we're in a fundamentally new era now in which just one species determines uh, the course of every other species on the planet. Uh, that species is us. So what does it mean to have that kind of power? And the monarch butterfly happens to be a really great creature to look at. It is evolving attempting to adapt in real time to an environment that is drastically transforming. And we can actually watch this happening. It's behaving in new and weird ways. It's doing different things. So in that way, it is, you know, an exemplar of the Anthropocene. So, so by looking at monarch butterflies, which I've been doing for the last four years, I want to try to tell the story about the future of life on this planet. Uh, and so that, that's what I do. Awesome. Um, so we have, we're at 7.15. That means we have 15 minutes until our hard cutoff. Like we are not going any past that. Okay. Um, but, uh, it's getting I, so dark, I'm gonna have to put on my lamp. I'm getting very dark here. No problem. <laughs> Uh, so for, so obviously for those of you on this call, um, we've been, you know, doing the Barnegat Bay book club and that's been an opportunity for us to kind of really dig into these different stories that make up our watershed and our area and how they've all affected us through space and time as Dan <laughs> likes to say. Um, so I just want to take a moment if it's okay and introduce a project that we're going to be working on in the Tom's River because it's a completely different project. You know, uh, we talk about toxic chemicals in this book, uh, the book named Tom's River, but in, in the now time, we're talking about pollution in a different context. And Britta Wenzel is our executive director. And I thought since all of you have an interest in Tom's River that you might have an interest in the project that we're going to be a part of. So Britta, if you can just highlight that Tom's River rally project. <laughs> sure. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Britta Wenzel. I'm the executive director for Save Barnegat Bay. And we just wanted to share with you that we are going to be starting a project with a sister group, uh, Clean Ocean Action. I like to call it a sister group because Cindy Ziff is the, the head honcho over there. Um, and we're mimicking a little bit of their work in the Northern Rivers and the Navisink uh, in that we want to look at the pathogen pollution in the Toms River. And so essentially the EPA reports that have been filed uh, from Barnegat Bay have shown that the Toms River is no longer fishable or swimmable under the regulations uh, for reporting on water quality. And so that's very concerning to us. And it's uh, driven largely by water quality, obviously, and one of the biggest indicators is pathogen pollution. So we're going to be uh, educating citizen volunteers to help us with water quality monitoring uh, in every one of the six towns in the basin of the Toms River. So that includes Island Heights, Toms River, South Toms River, Beechwood, Pine Beach, Ocean Gate. I think I got everybody there, six towns. Um, and we'll be bringing in specially trained dogs that can sniff out sanitary sewer leaks underneath the ground. So essentially we would train teams of citizens to conduct water quality monitoring along the edges of the river to try to identify hot spots. And then at a variety of scheduled times, we're gonna bring in these specially trained dogs into those hotspot areas. And those dogs will, like a bloodhound, sort of similar to that, 
uh, identify specifically where the sanitary sewer leak or the pipe is probably broken under the ground. And then along with the project, we do have many grants available for those six townships or their utility authorities in case it's Ocean County Utility Authority or one of the uh, municipal uh, utility authorities so that if they don't have enough funds in their repair budgets and their capital line items, that we'll be able to give those towns mini grants so that the repairs can be made. And so we're calling it a find it and fix it, no blame game. And hopefully in the end, it's gonna be three years, it's funded by the DEP or the Department of Environmental Protection. And uh, we're hoping to engage citizens uh, because those are the folks who really make a difference and we are partnering with all six towns and their public works and utility companies. So I wanted to tell you about that. It hasn't received a lot of media yet because it's just uh, getting underway. We're super excited about it and we partnered with Clean Ocean Action again because they're really the lead on the project. They've done this work already up in the Navisink using the dogs. Maybe not sort of the way we made the recipe for the Toms River uh, but Save Barnegat Bay has long-standing relationships with these municipalities and a lot of the public employees and the communities. So we'll be engaging the yacht clubs, community groups, and we're super excited about it. Hopefully we can help to clean up the Tom River in that way. And uh, Dan, thank you so much for being with us tonight and uh, sharing your passion with all of us. I know we have uh, people on this call who were very involved and um, I think it's emotional for all of us, really, who live here. And so thank you for taking the time tonight. Oh, it's really my, my pleasure. And uh, my hat's off to all of you guys who are doing the work every day. Uh, it's not glamorous work. Uh, it's uh, sometimes very sort of bureaucratic and very uh, processed. It's all about sort of following long, elaborate processes. But that's how you make change. Uh, uh, and it, it's so important that local environmentalists continue to do what they do because your work is, is so essential, especially right now. We have a comment here from someone just kind of highlighting how important journalism is in this whole web of, of all the pieces that come together and how the storytelling um, I won't read it verbatim, it's in the chat, but um, how, you know, the media really has such a big impact on our, you know, how we're seeing all these things. So thank you for being, for being a true journalist and getting every fact as correct as possible and just telling the whole story from front to back as clearly and as well as you possibly could. And um, it seems uh, another comment here is that we have Tom Fagan, who's a part of the Clean Ocean Action Board. You didn't mention that. <laughs> so uh, thank you everyone on the call who who you know maybe you already knew this story and you tuned in to be supportive and um thank you for those of you who didn't know about it and you're here to learn uh so please stay involved in all these things if, if there's any takeaway from dan's message it's that we need to stay involved and stay abreast of these issues and speak up in our communities and that's how we're going to make sure continuously that our water is clean and that our environment continues to improve um, so I, I think we don't have any more questions. Um, so thank you again, over and over. Thank you for your time and your work. We are so grateful. And uh, thank you to everyone on the call. And um, we will see you at our next Meet the Author event, which is in September, the end of September for uh, Great Storms of the Jersey Shore. We have two authors coming to speak to us for that. Um, and the newer edition does include Sandy. And you can catch this on YouTube as well as that uh, program on YouTube as well. So stay tuned, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Fagan. Thank you all very much. Really Thanks, appreciate, appreciate the great questions, too.